One more thing. There we go. All done. Hey, everyone. Actually, I should look over there. Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, December 6th, 2013. So joining me this week, it's it's the all-beard session of, uh, of the weekly space hangout. <laughs> Normally, we have a pretty strong female component, but today it is a lot of uh, guys with uh, their winter coats happening. So uh, Casey Dreyer from the Planetary Society. Hey, Casey. Hey. And we got... David Dickinson, a.k.a. the Astro hey. Guys. Hey. And uh, Dr. Matthew Francis. Greetings. Dr. Francis. All right. Uh, so just we're going to get into this, the standard weekly space hangout routine, which we normally do, where we cover all the big top stories in uh, space and astronomy. This week we've got some very interesting stories uh, we're going to be talking about a naked eye nova in Centaurus, uh, spotting Venus in the daytime sky, everything about Ison and how we lost it. I believe I've lost some bets, I no. think. <laughs> um, uh, a whole bunch about the uh, planetary society's uh, sort of updates on how uh, planetary science is losing funding. Uh, but Bill Nye fighting back. Um, uh, a small black hole pretending to be a giant black hole. Uh, some a possible explanation for dark matter and uh, is there anything else? If you guys think of anything else, let me know. Uh, we've we've had a bunch of people who who ended up being sick today, so unfortunately we're sort of uh, not all the stories we wanted to cover. So if anyone has anything else they want to talk about, we're glad to do it. So first, I think the big news, of course. Oh, right. Before I get into that, uh, if you want to interact with us, I have I have started up the Q and A app for Hangouts on Air. And I really love this app. It is a way that you can uh, interact with us. You can post questions into the Q&A app, and then as you post your questions, I can click, and then that'll be the question that we're answering right now. And then later on, if you're watching this, you can just go through the big list of questions and click on it to, to go and see that question get answered. It's, it's fantastic. And what's great is it works sort of wherever you are. So if you're in YouTube, or if you're watching this on Google+, Plus, if you're watching this somewhere embedded, it all sort of funnels you back to the same location. So if you have a question for the panelists today, uh, definitely use the Q&A app. And you should, wherever you're watching this video, you should be able to see the Q&A app there. Uh, okay, cool. Well, let's let's do the big news, which is Comet, Ison. <laughs> Ison is ice off, apparently. I, oh. I know. Oh, you, you, I... You, you the know, universe I, owes me a comet. I am, I am these, so. These sad. things always, these things always seem to come in pairs. So I wouldn't be surprised. Right after Kohotek, we had uh, in that fizzle, we had Comet West, which nobody saw because they were disappointed from Kohotek. And the same with Hayukutaki and Hill Bop. So you never know. There could be another, another big one coming out of nowhere. So. So what happened? Ison just didn't have the right stuff. Apparently, it. Uh, it, it didn't hold together, and it was a really interesting day that Thanksgiving too, because even I had I had sent out my eulogy tweet. I had said rest in peace, and then people started pinging me saying, "Uh, there's still stuff in the Soho, the Lasco C3 camera coming back around." So for a while, it looked like something something did survive perihelion, but it wasn't held together very well. About 24 hours later, it was dissipating again. Uh, so we went from Comet Ison is alive to Comet Ison is dead to Comet Ison might be alive. Two Comet Isons, we're still, we've been at Comet Ison is dead for about a week now. So there, there may be some material that made it around. I know Hubble is being tasked to try to find, and I know some amateurs have been sweeping around trying to find if there's any remnants of Ison. But if they are, they're like below 8th, ninth magnitude. They're very faint, whatever's left. Probably less than 100 meters across if there's anything left. Yeah, I've been tr I'm trying to dig up one of the videos. There's some great videos that showed the the comet come right in, and it was just blazing. This beautiful no. trail got got right was, around the sun. I was watching all of U.S. Thanksgiving Day. We were all watching. It was interesting when it didn't show up in SDO's cameras either. There was an interesting couple hours there where we, we were wondering uh, what exactly happened. I think it was just a little too faint to show up in SDO's cameras because you notice there wasn't any background stars. No Here we go. I got it. I got it. Here, hold on. Here we go. Um, and there'll be a lot we learn about, uh, you know, how well we don't see these kind of sun grazers very often. So we're, there's going to be a lot we're going to learn. But unfortunately, we didn't get the good, like the comet for the people that we were hoping we were going to get for star parties. And like we could go out and say, hey, there's a cool comet, and it just it looks like a comet, like you always think. So yeah, it was uh, it was it was unfortunate. 
No, I always thought it would have been interesting. Okay, here we um, go. Here we go. Let's let's watch this oh, here. We're gonna start from the beginning. Yeah. So here comes. Go, yeah. little buddy. Go. Where to go? Oh. <laughs> but then when it came back around, it, it it came back to life for a little bit. What was left, and it kind of gave us a little bit of false hope. We were gonna see. We knew after Perihelion, it wasn't gonna be Comet of the Century. Uh, we we knew from. But but when we saw it come around, we we're like, okay, we might have something to look at. Uh, but mm. wasn't to be. Not this one. I think I'm going to cry now. <laughs> there, is a new, there, is, there is a good fifth magnitude comet I've been tracking every morning, uh, Comet R1 Lovejoy, and there's been some pretty good images coming out of that, so we kind of have a, a consolation comet. So. Yeah. So uh, joining us uh, is Sandy Springman. Hey, Sandy. Hello. Oh, Greetings from Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. And you've got the observatory there in the background? If you can see it. I can't see anyone's video right now, so I have no idea how I look or what anyone else is seeing, but I'll... You're very backlit, so you're just a silhouette with a bright window behind you, but... That's... You can try to get just the bright window. You can maybe make out the telescope, but I can also close the curtains. I'll do um, that. Uh, sure, yeah, yeah, or just turn around on your desk. Um, okay, so we got a question here, so here's how this works. So I will take this question, I will select from Mark Tatter. Did Ison die because it was a first-timer, or was it just too close to the sun? I think it was both. Nothing's perfect around here, but that should work a little. <laughs> sure. I, I, think, I think it was a first-timer, it was too close to the sun, and, you know, what I haven't heard yet, they made a lot of talk about which way the nucleus was rotating beforehand for survival, whether it was a prograde or retrograde rotator, and I watched the live stream that they were doing uh, the post-perihelion discussion this morning for a little bit, I have not heard that answered yet, but I have a suspicion it was probably rotating uh, against the line of force when it went in b beyond the, the Roche limit of the sun and it got tore apart. We, we really couldn't tell which way it was rotating, but I know I know prograde was bad. What I got out of that news conference about a week or two prior, prograde was bad, retrograde was good. I have a feeling it was probably a prograde ro ro rotator. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, even in death, we learn quite a bit about about how these comets work and to try and predict them for future trajectories. So it's you know yeah. we got a little science out of this. We tell ourselves that to feel good. But. <laughs> you know, importantly too, you know, since the comet's not going to be big in our sky, we avoid the uh, cometary pestilence and uh, crashing of kingdoms and all the other negative things that comets bring us. Yeah. So I think we really <laughs> escaped a close call here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. you know, I, I wondered, you know, imagine Ison would have been coming toward the Earth on its outbound leg. Not saying it was, but had it had been, we had wanted the sun to destroy it. We would have been rooting for the sun to destroy it. <laughs> that would have been our only hope. <laughs> right, if it was on a collision course with us. On its outbound leg, yeah, like if, if the orbit had been right at the right angle where it would have been coming back at us when it came around the sun, we would have hoped the sun would have destroyed it. Yeah. Uh, all right. So now, Casey, I know you've got a book pretty quickly, so let's let's sort of move on and talk about some of the, the stories that you've been working on. And, you know, I didn't even need to know what you wanted to talk about when you joined, when you said, I'm in this week. I knew. Let me guess. <laughs> there's some funding getting cut somewhere, somehow. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, so if you uh, or anyone watching were following scientists on Twitter this week, particularly planetary scientists, you may have noticed... Uh, earlier this week, quite a bit of anger or some upset statements or just confusion. And a lot of this is because what happened? So NASA just a couple weeks ago announced out of the blue that they're going to be restructuring how they fund scientists. So this is going to hit very close to a lot of scientists who work on planetary issues. And what actually happened? They made this announcement this week, here's what we're doing. And on some parts, is isn't necessarily bad. They have about a dozen different funding lines scientists can propose to ask for money, do research, and so forth. They have a, you know, they, once or twice a year they make these applications. NASA wants to combine those down into about five major programs. Okay, that's not so bad. But what scientists started getting pretty upset about was that the biggest program, the so-called Solar System Workings grant, grant line, which contains quite a big swath of research, they won't be paying out on that new grant, this new line to fund scientists, until sometime in late 2015. So this effectively makes a large number of scientists have to skip a year to a year and a half 
of, of funding, which is really hard, particularly for scientists early on in their career, particularly for postdoctorates, particularly for scientists who want to fund graduate students. And you're really getting to the point where if this happens, you will very well may see a lot of scientists leaving the field very literally because they just can't pay their own bills. And so this is one of those consequences of what we've seen as this kind of decreasing line funding the planetary exploration program at NASA, but also all of NASA has been going down and research gets squeezed and ultimately scientists themselves get squeezed. So that was the big news today. And uh, we're scientists are pretty worried about this. There's a lot of confusion. No one's really clear what's going to happen yet because a lot of this depends on decisions that have yet to be publicized, but it's not really good news for anybody. So, you know, what kind of impacts can we expect to see in the in the coming years with this with this new modification, I guess, to the way the funding gets distributed? Sure. So what it, what it means for us in the public is basically we'll see less science. We're, we're going to effectively kind of hit our young career, sci early career young scientists pretty hard. So in a decade, there's going to be a, a science gap. There'll be fewer scientists working on the same types of problems. There's lots of data out there from all the spacecraft we've had up in the last decade. A lot of that data is not going to get looked at as much because scientists can't get paid to look at it. They'll have to take other jobs. You may see people leaving the field. So fundamentally for us in the public, it just means less science being done. Which generally uh, for me is bad. I like yeah, well, as a, as a uh, potentially as a young scientist, right? Yeah, um, or any, any young scientist, and I'm married to one, that which I, I try to keep separate from my profession. <laughs> but you see this, and a lot of friends of mine are young scientists. They, they, they want to... They're cheap in a way. It's a great investment for the government because... These young scientists don't make a lot of money, and they, they spend every penny they have just to keep living, but also doing science. And so it's not necessarily, you know, a lot of people are going to see this and say, well, scientists are whining about not getting money. But it's more than that. And this is where it's important, again, to bring up the big picture. It, it, scientists get really upset, honestly, because, again, it's their, their pocketbook. But also, they're not wasting money here. They're trying to go out and, and figure things out about the solar system and about how we came to be and they just won't be able to do that, and that's what we suffer from. But isn't a big problem of this just the fact that all of this funding for this kind of science really flows through this one channel, and it's in many cases it's just the whim of of the current government, of current funding policy, whatever. It's really hard to... You, it's not like, you know, if you're a planetary scientist working on data from the Cassini mission, it and you've built a career on this, it's not like you can go and, and go to the competitor you know like if you're in computer science or if you're in medicine or whatever you can switch from from company to company following your own career you know same like Sandy I mean you've got you know there aren't a lot of big radio observatories that you can go around the world to you know if, if funding dries up. And the NSF up. has recently decided that radio astronomy really isn't a thing to be funding anymore so we're gonna see a lot less radio astronomy and going forward but yeah, yeah, you're right, Fraser. A lot of this is because NASA, uh, particularly for planetary science, they have a little bit of NSF, as what Sandy was saying, for radio astronomy. But uh, NASA is the sole source of funding for almost the entire planetary science community. And that's because NASA effectively created the field of planetary science. It didn't exist before 1962 with Mariner 2. And, or 1960, yeah, 1962. And uh, the this field is so NASA dependent, there's no Cassini corporation to go to who's privately exploring Cassini because this is what government does. It does fundamental research that then can be spun off into private industry, that then can be spun off into other parts of our society, but that's the role of government is to promote this kind of science, fundamental science, and there's no really alternatives for this, and so people get really stuck when funding goes down. Now, your boss at the Planetary Society responded with a letter, and so can you sort of, to the president, yes. right? Yeah, so uh, everyone check out, it's on planetary.org, it's right on the front page. Bill Nye did record a special open letter to the president saying, Mr. President, we highly encourage you to embrace planetary exploration as one of the big visions at NASA. You know, we have this huge potential, we have these vast unknown explorable worlds that are just waiting there to be discovered and we can go. There's nothing technologically there stopping us. It's just our own decision not to prioritize that. 
And so he asks for $1.5 billion. That's our kind of flat number. That's a historical average. We could go to Europa with it. We can refund scientists to do science. We can go start a campaign to return a sample of Mars to return it to the Earth. And then we can also increase the smaller missions. We can get a real kind of healthy exploration of the solar system for less than 10% of NASA's budget. So Bill released this video today. We sent it to the president. We're asking other people to also stand with him and to stand with us to also write the president and their elected officials. You can do that at planetary.org slash SOS. And the more they hear from the public about this, the more likely this will happen. Congress has generally been very supportive, but what we've seen, unfortunately, is that the White House keeps planetary exploration, at least, pretty low on their priority level. We want to push that up, and so they work to protect it. Congress will support them, and we can see uh, a, a really glorious future ahead of us, or we can kind of be here and to watch the whole thing crumble and decline. It's really up to us. Well, and I, I did a video rant about this a couple of months back, which is that I really find it crazy that the that the the science the planetary ex exploration and the human spaceflight are have to battle each other for funding they're really two separate endeavors that shouldn't have to battle each other for funding planetary science should be its own separate funding you know and by all means take away from this mission to give to that mission or whatever makes sense but once you're you're taking from the entire program to feed something else it's for me it's just it's crazy and you know and, yeah, it, the, and it sets the wrong people against each other. It sets, you know, planetary scientists against people who are for human spaceflight, and that's madness. It is, and because we need both of them, right? And and every astronaut will tell you we need robotic missions, and almost everyone who works robotic science missions say we need astronauts to go out there and really explore for humanity and to represent us. And it's a it's a very simpatico kind of relationship. And this is the consequence of a shrinking fixed budget, but with also larding on more and more things to give NASA to do. As you've seen right now, as we've talked about before, NASA's making a new rocket. It's making a new crew vehicle. It's paying private companies to make new rockets. It's paying private companies to make new crew vehicles. It's also maintaining the space station. It's also funding small business innovation. It's also funding new technology lines. It's doing space science, planetary science, heliophysics, astrophysics, the James Webb Space Telescope. And it's trying to do this within a shrinking budget. So, of course, things are going to be squeezed. And, again, that's why we're saying we, just, we bump it up just a little bit. And the Senate has actually given NASA more money than the president requested on the Senate side. House has not followed suit. It's kind of stuck in this weird limbo. But the, the political will tends to be there. People tend in government, bipartisan, to support NASA and to support exploration and to support science. It's just pushing them across the line. And that's where we really need to make sure that the public speaks out about this. They hear about this. NASA, when people write letters about NASA, they notice because most people are writing letters about Social Security and health care and guns and all these really contentious political issues. They see something about NASA, they go like, oh, yeah, we should give that some thought because it'll, it'll peak up above the noise that they usually see in the congressional office or in the White House or in the policy areas in, in Washington, D.C. So the more people we get, the bigger difference you can make, and we're really tantalizingly close to making, to fixing a lot of this. It's just pushing everyone over the line. Well, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> now, I know you've got a book out, so, so feel free to leave whenever you need to. Thanks, folks. Pleasure being here today. Thanks, Casey. Keep yeah. us updated. Okay, happy but to But bring good news. Can you, can you come, like, sometime when you've got good news and just bring... <laughs> yeah, I'll promise I'll come when I have good news. And uh, I, I'll toss out also something that, I don't know if anyone's been following this, but the Chinese did go into lunar orbit today uh, with their Chang'e 3 uh, mission that will land on the moon December 14th. In less than two weeks, we'll have the first soft landing on the moon since the 1970s. And so that, that's kind of an exciting piece. And then also with India going, finally went into uh, the Martian trajectory, so they're going to Mars now. Uh, those are two kind of exciting developments in planetary exploration. We're seeing two new countries really step up and push the boundaries and really give everyone a run for their money. So and that's Rosetta kind of a, is only about Rosetta. 11 months away from yeah. harpooning a comet. <laughs> so, so luckily the Europeans, Indians, and Chinese are all uh, picking up a lot of slack uh, right now and giving us a lot of exciting things to look forward to. Awesome. All right. All right well, thanks, thanks Casey. Folks. Yep. Uh, okay, well, Sandy, thanks for thanks for jumping in at the last minute. And uh, so, 
I'm not sure how much time you have. I understand you have asteroids to zap or something. <laughs> so. Always, always. We have 800 hours a year of asteroids, asteroid zapping. Uh, so you've got... you. There's a new high-resolution uh, video of the... And I'm, I'm going to show this video, and you, then you'll explain what it is that we're looking at, which is the, the, uh, the hexagon on Saturn. Yeah, it's pretty cool. All right, let me see if I can make this happen here. Come on, technology. Oh, it's over there. There's some ads. Perfect. All right, let's start from the beginning again. So what are we looking at? So we're looking at what's effectively an atmospheric river on Saturn. So if you're sitting inside Saturn, you'd actually see this as a wiggly sine wave. But just because of the way we look at Saturn, we see it as a hexagon. So we have atmospheric jets here on Earth. We have Gulf Stream. We have things like that. But on these giant planets, there's no solids. There's no continents. The, uh, the weather behaves very differently. So if you look at Jupiter, if you look at Saturn, they're banded. They have a jet blowing eastward, a jet blowing westward. They alternate. And so this jet of, up at the north pole of Saturn has actually produced this hexagon. And this thing is gigantic. The winds are blowing at uh, hundreds of miles an hour on the order of uh, and you know, over 200 miles an hour. The storm's over 20,000 miles across. It's pretty cool. And we've seen this, this hexagon wiggle. We've seen this jet for at least 30 years since the Voyager went by. Uh, Voyager went by Saturn, but for a long time, 30 years, this was in uh, shadow at the North Pole of Saturn, so we could observe it with IR instruments. But finally, the North Pole came into sunlight recently, and so now with Cassini, we can actually get images of it, and we can animate those images in both IR and IR, and we can actually see this thing moving, and we can get an idea of the clouds, uh, the cloud speeds, and everything just matches up. So it's a pretty neat feature. And is it one of, like, is it, a lot of people consider it to be a mystery of the solar system. Would you say it's pretty understood at this point? I think it's pretty understood. I mean, it could have lasted for centuries, but the, the physics and the atmospheric physics are pretty straightforward as far as people know. Um, and, but we've only really been looking at this, uh, we've only been looking at it for a year, so there could be more mysteries here, but it's not, it's not some weird cosmic eye, it's not a sign from the aliens. Um, but it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a jet that wiggles, and it happens to have six wiggles. And depending on the... Um, I was talking to someone about this recently. You could see features like this on exoplanets, but instead of having six sides, they could possibly have five sides or seven sides or eight sides. It really just depends on the property of the atmosphere. So it's pretty cool. And in understanding these jets on Saturn, also on other planets, it really gives us an understanding of how our atmosphere behaves. Is our atmosphere special? Is our atmosphere unique? Or is it a lot like atmospheres on other of these giant planets? Well, I've got some really funky music happening in my ears here as I try to play this video. Do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some kind of new age music. Thanks, NASA. Um, that's great. One well, is, I mean, are, does one of these exist on other planets in the solar system? Do they have one on Jupiter? Is there one on? I don't think anything's been seen on Jupiter. We've only seen the Saturn one, so it's a, uh, it's pretty cool. That and I've also heard that amateurs, some amateurs, have been able to spot it. David, have you ever? You followed that, didn't you? You're muted, David. Mute, mute, mute. Demute. No, nope, still muted. Oh well. I'm sure he'll figure it yeah, out. I mean, there's a lot that amateurs can do with monitoring of Saturn and Jupiter with their um, with telescopes. So you know, some people say, oh, am, you know, there's a lot amateurs can do here to really support the community and support observations of Saturn, especially transients in the atmospheres, looking at small meteorites that impact, and you can really get a sense of what the meteorite was made of, and this, um, a little bit about the atmospheric composition, and you can also start getting ideas about the population of small bodies in the outer solar system, and which ones encounter Saturn and Jupiter. Are you back, David? I think so. Try. I think, there you are. Hmm. I you? think you've changed microphones. Yeah, I, I got three microphones. I tried an alternate one just just for troubleshooting here. I don't know how well you can hear me in this one, but but yeah, I think um, Christopher Go, I want to say, has imaged this uh, this feature before on Saturn. I'm pretty sure I've seen uh, seen some of his. Uh, if anybody caught it, it would have been him. So. 
It's kind of tough because it's at an angle, right? And so yeah, we're... because you're looking at the poles, you're not going to ever see the the poles of Saturn are tipped toward us ever. So yeah, so you would you know in this case Cassini is able to fly right over the pole of of Saturn and be able to image straight down at it. Right? Yeah, yeah, you're you're just going to see that kind of oblique side view. It tilts toward us maybe by I believe twenty degrees max, but yeah. Uh, so let's see here. So we've got a question here. Uh, so why is it hexagonal? Do we know? So you said, Sonny, that it you know it could be five sides, it could be seven sides. Why is it five? Sorry, hexagonal specifically. Yeah, I had this explained to me about a week ago, and I really can't give you an answer. But it has to do with I think um, the thickness of the jet. So depending on the size of the jet, depending on how thick the jet is, you could have different amounts of nodes. So if you've taken any sort of vibrational physics classes, vibrations and waves, um, if you've ever taken a jump rope with a friend or a slinky and slung it up and down, you'll see you can develop, you can see how many peaks and troughs you can develop in your slinky if you're shaking it up and down. A lot of people have done that in high school physics class. And it's the same physics at play here. So just depending on the velocity and the size, you can get, um, you can get six peaks like you see here. Or if it was, things were slightly different, you could get five peaks or seven peaks depending on how, on the size of the jet and how fast things are moving. So if we are ever, ever able to image other exo, exoplanets, we might be able, we might see hexagons or septagons or octagons at their poles. But if you were sitting inside Saturn and looking up, not that you could, you would see just it looked like a wiggle. It would look like just a sine wave. In the sky, right? Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yeah, if you ah. deproject it in latitude longitude space instead of polar coordinates, it looks just like a wiggle. It's very cool. It is cool. Uh, that's awesome. Okay, uh, Dr. Francis, you've yes, got. Sir. Let's let's go with your information about a uh, a Hobbit-sized black hole pretending to be a giant. Okay. Well, um, a lot of us are are familiar with you know sort of the the two major types of black holes. You've got the the uh, uh, star-sized ones, the stellar mass black holes like Cygnus X1, that's the first black hole that, where we knew what we were seeing. Um, and that's, you know, that's the kind of black hole that's formed from the death of a very massive star. And then there's the heavyweight black holes, the supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. And there's been some question among researchers about whether there's something in between the intermediate mass black holes. Um, and there have been a few uh, black holes that, that uh, I should say, black hole candidates over the years that uh, people have identified. Uh-oh. No. You know, 100 to 1,000 times the mass of the sun. And uh, so what we're looking at here is is a, uh, let's see. Now, now, the, now, if you can spot which one, can you, can, now, now do you know which, which of those blue dots is the black hole? I think it's the... Uh, the one, if you go f straight out from the nucleus to uh, that one there, I believe is the the black hole in question. Um, but it's uh, um, this is a black hole that appears to be an intermediate mass black hole based on the rate it's eating stuff. So when matter falls onto a black hole, it heats up, it glows, and uh, a lot of it gets ejected back out into space, and that whole process makes black holes very bright. And so based on the emissions from this black hole, it looks like it's an intermediate mass black hole. It looks like it's a few hundred times the mass of the sun. Observations found it is actually a black hole in a binary. It's actually or mutually orbiting a star. And that is great when that happens because you can figure out masses directly then using good old uh, uh, laws of, of motion and uh, Kepler's laws, which you might have learned in school. Um, the basic, basic, basic stuff you can do with a hand calculator and you find out that, whoa, this thing is probably 20 to 30 times the mass of the sun. Um, that's not an intermediate mass black hole. That's a stellar mass black hole. So why is it producing so much light? And that's a mystery. We do not know. It, it means that it 
it's got to be feeding at a much higher rate than, than should be possible for a black hole. So we've solved one mystery and created another one. So it's a very interesting, interesting question. Have any intermediate black mass black holes really been found? I know, you know, the the candidate, the place people have been looking is within uh, globular clusters, hoping that there's going to be some kind of uh, intermediate black hole in one of those. But you've really just got these stellar mass ones and then the supermassive, and not the kind of in between black holes that you'd be expecting. Well, you, basically, the 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 best candidates for intermediate mass black holes are something are things known as ultra luminous X-ray sources, um, and those are uh, there's a few of those that are known, but um, some of them may be black holes, some of them may not, and of course now we've got to go back and relook at some of these and say, well, if this one is not an intermediate mass black hole, maybe these other ones are also. Uh, small black holes pretending to be much bigger, in which case we may have an entirely new physical phenomenon going on uh, based on black holes. And that's a really intriguing idea. So it's got to be, I mean, like what would overfeed a black hole? Right? Like you're just gobbling a star directly? Uh, <laughs> running, pouring through a star-forming nebula? I mean, it's got to it's gotta be a pretty rich meal. Well, the thing with the thing with this is, if it's in a binary system, it's like Cygnus X one. It's stripping matter off of this other star, and the the behavior of this system is that it has kind of quiet periods, and then it has this big spike of X ray emissions. And it's possible that there's some process going on that we don't fully understand during that big spike in emission. Um, it's possible also that it's feeding on another source, and that, that I don't know based on the based on the published paper. Um, I'm not sure anybody else does either. It's how, just how, cloud how right through the middle of a star. That's that's my prediction. How how distant is this source? Do you have any idea? Did it say? Um, this is the Pinwheel Galaxy, and oh, I do okay. not know which. I, I don't know how many light years that is away. Probably extra galactic um, distances. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's, it's very much ways. extra galactic it's source. Ways. Yeah. Right. And as far as I know, there's no intermediate mass black hole candidate in the Milky Way. Yeah. Super interesting. interesting. Um, okay, well, uh, David, you've got... Uh, it's time to look for Venus. Yeah, actually, I was out looking yesterday, and I've been watching for a few days. Uh, now that we have the moon just past new this week, and you're starting to get the crescent moon in the daytime... Uh, yesterday was a very good day to see uh, Venus right near the moon, and it's it's about 15 degrees away, so you could still do it today. Uh, I noticed the daytime moon. I haven't tried to see Venus during the daytime yet, but I've I've seen it. It's actually very surprisingly easy to see, and the reason is Venus is at its greatest brilliancy right now for 2013. As a matter of fact, today is its maximum illumination. It's negative 4.7 magnitude, which is third brightest object in the sky next to the sun and the moon. And like I said, it's very, uh, I've, I've seen it with binoculars, I've seen it with the naked eye. It's right now, it's about the same phase as the moon, too, so it's interesting if you look at it with binoculars or a telescope, Venus and the moon both have that crescent phase right now. Are they so lined up? That, that that's always looks amazing when you see them. They were yesterday. Yeah. They were, they were lined up about eight degrees apart, and they were lined up. They're both very far south because they're they're toward that part of the ecliptic that the sun is headed toward. Uh, with the winter solstice coming up here in a few weeks. So everything is kind of buried, for Northern Hemisphere observers, everything's kind of buried down south. Venus is as far south as it's been since 1930 right now, so it's very far south. And we're going to beat that again on the next. Venus goes through eight-year cycles, so you'll get about the same kind of setup eight years later. Uh, that's because uh, Venus orbits 13 times for every er, eight orbits of the Earth, so there's kind of a, a synchronization there. So in right around 2021, you're going to have that same pattern. Just like last year, we had, remember, we had Venus transit the Sun. Now, it's not going to transit eight years from last year. It's going to miss, but it also went through the Pleiades. It's going to go even closer to the Pleiades in 2020, and we're going to have that eight-year cycle every eight years Venus is going to approach the Pleiades in the evening again, and it's going to get closer and closer every time it does it. So it's kind of, although Venus doesn't show much detail in the telescope, it's kind of neat. To, I'm doing a star party tomorrow night, and I'll probably show people the, the little crescent phase on it and stuff, and it's kind of, it's one of the first things Galileo saw when he aimed his telescope toward it. 
And I think it's interesting. A lot of times there have been people that it's been persisted for years that people claim that you can see the crescent phase of Venus with your naked eye if you have very good sky conditions and you have very good vision. But um, I think it's interesting. Nobody noticed it before Galileo invented the telescope. So it's it's kind of one of those myths that persist out there, but I don't know how true it is. Couldn't you project it, though? Like, I know, you know, we've had this conversation that you can cast shadows with Venus. Yes. Right? Yeah, Venus is bright enough right now. If you were somewhere that's a dark sky site uh, and there's no other uh, light around, unfortunately, you're getting the crescent moon right now, Venus can cast shadows, especially if you were against something with high contrast, like, say, a good snow cover right now being December. A lot of people have snow on the ground. And I have seen people do time exposures with DSLRs where you could aim it towards where your shadow is on the ground, and you could probably, even though you can't see it with the naked eye, do about a 10 or 20 minute, uh, 20 second exposure, and you could probably pick out the shadow of Venus there in, in your DSLR image. Yeah, you might even have the twin shadow. That's great. So now's the time. It's at its brightest. So now's your chance. Go out. Yes. Dark skies. Try to see if you can see Venus. Um, the the shadows cast by Venus. Shadows cast by Venus. That's really cool. All right, and then, Matthew, you've got your second story here, and this is great. This is so cool. So uh, potentially, maybe, dark matter, maybe, in an experiment, possibly? Well, we have to, we have to use all the weasel words. We Let's can, use every we single one. Let's get them all in. Possibly. Scientists have possibly, maybe, under certain conditions, perhaps, seen indications of what might match some kind of of exactly. theorized possibilities. <laughs> the, the, those, those weasel words are exactly the right maybes that we need. Um, but, but the thing is, it's one of those stories that, it's, it's like so many things, it, the payoff would be so incredible that we have to pay attention to this, even if the probability of it being correct is low. And here's the deal. Uh, most, of the, most of the work on dark matter has focused on a type called the weakly interacting massive particles, or WIMPs. Uh, WIMPs are generally in a weight class heavier than protons, so heavier than the ordinary particles that make up uh, matter of daily life, um, which is the massive part of their name. Um, but there's another type of particle that was predicted back in the 1970s to solve a problem with uh, nuclear forces. And that particle is called the axion. So this one that maybe you maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. It's not as widely talked about. The thing about axions is that they're really low mass. Um, they may even be lower mass than neutrinos, which we still don't know exactly how massive neutrinos are. But the thing is about them is that if axions exist, the Big Bang made them in huge. And so there'd be a lot of them out there. And because of their nature, um, when the universe was expanding, what they did is they actually got colder and formed kind of a soup. Uh, it's called, the technical name for that is a Bose-Einstein condensate. So we're talking. So here we're talking dark matter, but we're we're bringing in we're bringing in condensed matter physics and nuclear physics and all this stuff. So this all goes Bingo. together. Yes, yeah, so we've we practically got the physics bingo here because the way that this new paper proposes that we could detect these axions is actually using superconductors, a superconducting device called a Josephson junction. Um, and so the idea is this Josephson junction is you've got two superconductors that are very close together and there's a gap between them. And the idea is that when axions go through that gap, what they do is they actually, when, when, the, when the circuit is tuned to the right frequency, it actually sends ordinarily see. So it looks like noise. It looks like a boost in the, the signal that's random. But if these are axions, then that frequency corresponds to the axion mass. So in other words, this would be a way to detect axions and be a way to figure out what their mass is. So this is, to, to quote Keanu Reeves, whoa, this could be very important if... Yeah, that's that's a picture of... Actually, that's a picture of two Josephson junctions. Um, if you look at the the kind of the, the you've got a tuning fork appearance there um, two tuning forks glued together the places where those tuning forks join those are Josephson junctions um, this is very small isn't it 
This is very small, yeah, and it's very cold. Superconductors require very low temperature, which, of course, you, you kind of would expect. If you're looking for something that's low mass, it would be very easy for a signal coming from such a thing to be confused. Where we have to bring in all our weasel words. This says, if axions exist, no guarantee they exist, and if they have the mass corresponding to this particular range, then maybe this signal in superconductors might be dark matter. So we found dark matter. Is, is this the kind of dark matter they keep saying is like in the room with me now, or is this like something really exotic? It would be in the room with you now, but actually okay. any dark matter would be in the room with you now. It's just awesome. axions because they're <laughs> such low because they're such low mass, there'd be that many more axions in the room with you than a wimp. Cool. So like, um, and I and I will say too that of all the dark matter candidates, I think I I think I like axions the best, just because they are. At, it, I, I'm a theoretical physicist by training, and we're really obsessed with elegance and and beauty, and axions are a beautiful theory. Um, this proposal that we've detect that that we could detect axions using Josephson junctions is also beautiful. But that's no guarantee it's correct. So um, the more you want to believe it, the more you should be skeptical of it. And so I will say this again in case it isn't very clear. Be skeptical of this. You can be hopeful. I will give you permission to be hopeful, but be very, very skeptical. But aren't we starting to... Like the, the traditional ways that people have been looking for wimps in the various experiments and in the... Uh, in the Large Hadron Collider, they're starting to run out of the expected parameters for what dark matter should be. And so some of these other theories are starting to to get looked at again, right? Well, there, there, there's, a, there's a bit of yes and no. We haven't run out of space to look for WIMPs, but we've, we've kind of... Um, there, there's one particular model for WIMPs that comes out of supersymmetry. Part of a particle class of particle physics theories, I should say. Um, the problem is supersymmetry is a symmetry, and it's not itself a particle physics theory. And so there's a whole bunch of particle physics theories you can build around it. And we've been able to to sort of put major restrictions on what's possible in some of those versions. But it's kind of like uh, super. Th this is part of the reason why I prefer axions to to super to wimps is because supersymmetry kind of feels like whack-a-mole at some point. Oh, if this doesn't work, let's just you know let's just try something else. Um, axions, if they exist, are you know, relatively conceptually simple. And now, of course, I'm going to get all the people hating on me for for coming down on <laughs> supersymmetry, but. Uh, Bring it on. <laughs> uh, that's okay. That's all right. Um, send your emails. Where should they send their emails? Send angry emails. <laughs> to to, to uh, Brian Cox Brian at Cox. ABC. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Well, so we've got a couple more stories. So the big one, of course, is the SpaceX launch. And we had been sort of... That was all touch and go over the course of the, of the week. Yeah, they, and they, uh, they finally and, went... Uh, Tuesday, I believe Tuesday. it was. It was after three tries. They, they tried Thanksgiving evening. Yeah, Thanksgiving was a real downer because we lost Ison, and we all tuned into the SpaceX launch, and, and that uh, canceled out too. So oh, I, I remember that was. But yeah, it went right there in the evening at Cape Canaveral. I actually saw it from here. Uh, I was watching it with binoculars. I watched it all the way through uh, second staging. I could see the fairings go away and uh, the staging go in the, the first stage light, and that was kind of cool. So they, they were sending, this is the first time they have sent off a Falcon 9 version 1.1 to a uh, geosynchronous transfer orbit. They put up the SES-8 satellite up there for, for a new customer. Uh, but yeah, this is the first time they've done anything beyond low Earth orbit, and everything, as far as I've heard, everything went fine. Everything deployed fine on that, so it was, uh, after they got off the pad, it was a flawless launch. It just took three times to do it, so... This is when we start to hear that sucking sound of all of the budget going flowing towards SpaceX. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. They're 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 not quite they're not quite on their own legs yet. Yes, yeah, so that, that that is true. They're 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 a private entity, but they still rely heavily on NASA funding. So, but I mean, no, but I mean, just the 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 level of capability for the price that they're able to bring to the table, and yeah. they're, they're expanding. 
uh, you know, capabilities as well. It's going to be, I think we're going to see over the next couple of, of years just a ton of these launches just heading towards SpaceX now. Oh, yeah, because they're going to launch the Sentinel uh, Space Telescope. Uh, Cyg uh, Cygnus in uh, Orbital Sciences is in the game now, and there's some other players coming up too. So there's a lot of other private companies coming up. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say Orbital Orbital's a lot less flashy, but they're yeah. you know they're they're also taking the more I would say the more conservative approach. They're not being quite as flashy in their in their launch vehicle yeah. uh, uh, capabilities, but that also means. Yeah. Just in the last year, they've they've had several successful launches that that have. Yeah, they, uh, they've docked to the International Space Station now too. So yeah. And they uh, launched Laddie. Yeah. Yep. The lunar the lunar mission was on a. Uh, what well, was on a Minotaur? Right? Oh, that was on a Minotaur five. Yeah, it was on a Minotaur five. Yeah, that was yeah right. Yeah, I think once the Falcon Nine Heavy gets rolling, I think a lot of you know the the Boeing's and the Lockheed Martins and stuff are are going to have to uh, step up their game a bit. I think the heavy's going next year or 2015. I think the first test flight. I thought it was 2015, but yeah, it's it's coming up yeah. though. Yeah. Yeah, really interesting. Like the uh, seeing the I you know I mentioned I I went to the SpaceX factory uh, about a month ago and uh, just a terrific place. Really amazing uh, the, what they the, what they're doing there. The first unmanned flight of the uh, of the Orion capsule is next year too. That's coming up within a year too, 2014. So yeah, and so once they're sending humans to space to the space station, and yeah, and again, that's... you know, new new rockets coming on board, new engines coming on board. Yeah, it, they're they're really moving forward. So it's weird. It's like we feel so bad about all the cuts to planetary exploration, <laughs> but then we're really happy about all of these other countries that are sending spacecraft places, and then we're yeah anyway. Uh, okay, well, so I think you've got one more story here, uh, it was David. The best of the... times, it was the worst of times. <laughs> <laughs> it was the worst of times. Um, David, you've got one last story about a new Naked yes. Eye Nova. Yes, there is a new Nova. Unfortunately, it's way in the southern hemisphere in the constellation Centaurus. Uh, it's about at, at negative 60 degrees south, so it, you've got to be basically uh, like 10 degrees north or lower to really get this really well. Uh, the name is Nova Centauri 2013, and it's actually got a new, I found out from the AABSL, the American Association of Variable Star Observers this morning, it has another designation now, and a new phone number name of v 1369 Sen. So, it's interesting, it's interesting, we've had two Naked Eye Novas this year already, yeah. because we had uh, one in Delphinus earlier this year. Uh, that's kind of rare. Uh, these two are already in the, in the category of the 30 brightest novas that we've had. These these are in our galaxy. These aren't supernovas. That's the first I had to kill on Twitter. Uh, these are just garden variety novas. But this one right now is at magnitude uh, 3.8, so it's actually brighter than uh, Nova Delphini 2013. It's interesting that since it's in the southern hemisphere, it's not getting as much because I noticed uh, no, the one in Delphinus earlier this year was everywhere across the news. This one's really kind of going under the radar. I mean, we wrote about it this week, and there's been some images from some astrophotographers down in South America and Australia have been watching it, but it hasn't got the, nearly the press that, that the one up in Northern Hemisphere did. Now, one last piece of hope, uh, which is that Lovejoy is visible is vis much more visible yes. now, right? Even yeah, our, with the unaided eye, you can see it with the naked eye, right? Our one Lovejoy is just above naked eye visibility, about fifth fifth magnitude in the early morning sky. Uh, it's in the constellation uh, Corona Borealis right now. So it's up in the if you're about thirty to forty degrees north latitude, you get up about an hour before sunrise. It's about twenty thirty degrees above the northeastern horizon. Uh, take a pair of binoculars and just kind of sweep around uh, door below the the Big Dipper is what I did this morning, and you can see it as a little fuzz ball there. And there's been some pretty good amateur images there. They're showing a little ten degree tail on it. So we've got a constellation comet kind of yeah. we lost ice and so. Well, that's all. And, right. I, and like I said, they they always seem to come in pairs. I mean, uh, Comet Holly and come in the Great Comet of 1910 and Hale-Bopp and Hayukutaki, so you never know. I actually like Hayukutaki because that came with no fanfare just out of nowhere. And within a month, we had a great comment. We didn't have this one-year build-up like we did to Ison and then get disappointed on it. So. We uh, might so be zapping Ison, not next week, but the week 
after that. So if there's any debris Ooh, left cool. that isn't necessarily oh. naked eye visible. So, Sandy, you weren't you weren't enough. here. You weren't here for the beginning of the show. Ison's dead. <laughs> there might be stuff left. Yeah. There, we've done some math. We might be able to get it. So we're dedicating at least a d day to it. So what we can see with radar, you can't see with your <laughs> telescope. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, I've got a question here. Uh, yeah, yeah, from... yeah, I sound dead, I know. <laughs> <laughs> from Deborah Barton. Uh, please explain what a nova is and can one hit the Earth? Oh, a nova like this? This, this is just your garden variety. You've got uh, like a, a red dwarf, a red giant star dumping matter onto a white dwarf, and it's it's kind of uh, intermittently uh, undergoing fusion. It's not quite big enough to do a, the, the whole type 2A, type 1A supernova type deal. But Yeah, you've got this yeah, situation this, where you've this got... Is like... most... Really they, far they don't away, know. hundreds or thousands of light years they, away. They don't right. know the distance on this one yet, but its odds are. I know uh, no, the Nova in Delphinus, when they pegged down the distance, was within a, it was over a thousand light years away. So uh, yeah. none of these are, are anywhere near our, our our galactic neighborhood. And you're in a galaxy. great situation, right? You got the you got the red giant, you got this white dwarf. They're orbiting one another, and the white dwarf is pulling this stream of material. Uh, on from the red giant and it's piling up on the surface of the white dwarf and then it piles up to a certain point that it kind of ha goes off like a little bomb on the surface of the uh, of yeah. the white dwarf and then it goes back to the beginning and keeps piling there, that material up. There are there are stars that are reoccurring nova like T Pixidus in uh, U Scorpii that do that every 10 or 15 years that we observe too. And so no it's absolutely no risk today but sort of one of the methods that you can create a supernova is with these type 1A supernovae and you have the situation where where this happens for a long period of time and eventually the the white dwarf star crosses this limit what is it 1.4 times the mass of a of a regular star yeah, yeah, yeah. of the sun so yeah. yeah and then at that point it, it detonates as a supernova and uh, yeah we we haven't seen a naked eye supernova in our galaxy since the invention of the telescope uh, Kepler's supernova in 1604 was the last one so yeah. So no, absolutely no risk. Don't worry about no. That, that would be a big, big story if we had a, a, a like, say, Betelgeuse is a can Nova candidate. Spica is a Nova candidate. Those are fairly nearby. And a Carini. Yeah. yeah. They're nearby. Say a few hundred light years. They're still out of the kill zone. So not yeah, nearby. The, like yeah, civilization I mean, you're, wiping out nearby. If a supernova goes off within a hundred light years of the Earth, it's a problem. The closest supernova candidate is Spica, which is 260 light years away. So, so we are totally safe from right. any supernova. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, cool, awesome. Okay, well, I think we're I think we've wrapped up uh, all of the stories we wanted to talk about. So, thanks everyone for uh, for joining us. Now, Sandy, where do we find out more? about all of the zapping that's happening. You're muted, Vic. You're muted, Sandy. Muted, still muted. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Sandy, S-O-N-D-Y. Does it show up in my the yep. bottom of my screen? I can't see my video at all. Great. Um, I may or may not be live tweeting tonight's zapping. Um, yeah, it's good fun. We find them before they find us. And and when you and when you live tweet, are you going to post any like links to some of the data that you're producing? Um, it's not that exciting if you don't stare at radar data all the time. But I might <laughs> say, oh, this is the object we're looking at. Andy Rivkin. I don't know if anyone follows him on Twitter. He's A S Rivkin R I V K I N. He was live tweeting this morning, uh, taking uh, asteroid spectra from the IRTF in Hawaii. So he was talking about Pallas and Cleopatra, which is a metallic dog bone the size of New Jersey with two moons. That is awesome. Cool. David, where do we find out more? I was active this week on my own site, Astro Guys with the Z, Universe Today, Listosaur, Canada.com. I've got some new sci-fi poetry coming out in Starline Magazine this month, and I will be doing scope duty at Starkey Park in Pasco County tomorrow night at a star party. Free. If you're in the area, come on out. Now, can, now am I allowed to talk about the wonderful 101... Things to look at. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah uh, that's coming out I'm, soon, right? I'm, I'm going to be doing. I, I usually I've been doing that a few years on Astro Guys, but I'm going to do it on Universe today because it gets a little more exposure. Uh, I'm doing uh, 101 events for 2014. Uh, the the predictable, all the eclipses, all the supermoons. Plus, I, I usually throw in some weird things that that come my way as far as uh, everything that's going to be going on in the sky. The top 101 events for the next coming year. So. That's fantastic. It's a, fun, it's a fun post to do, and I always I always ignite a lot of controversy because somebody's like, "Why didn't you include?" It's like you know, whatever. 
Uh, Dr. Francis, where do we find out more? Uh, well, I'm on Twitter at doc at Dr. M. R. Francis, not Dr. Mister, Dr. M. R. Francis. Um, you can find, uh, I've been actually doing a science advent calendar on my site, galileospendulum.org. Today That's was cool. neutrinos. So Today something was new to open up every day? Yeah, as well as, if, if, you, if you call it? having a new blog window uh, thing, and there's no chocolate involved, unfortunately. But uh, it's uh, a different uh, science-related image or video um, uh, trying to cover, actually, a wide variety of topics this year, although astronomy is, is probably dominating just because the pr pictures are prettier. But, uh, and uh, I can also be found around the web at various places. I've got a Story. The the uh, stories I talked about today are both published in Ars Technica, um, but I you can you can find me a lot of different places. You you have been known to write for Universe Today, even. I've even written for Universe Today. I think once or twice. Yes. Yeah. I need to do that more. We are a black hole that siphons all the writing resources of the universe. Um. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for watching. I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks to the panelists for joining us, and I know, and for the, those of those out there who wanted to join us but were sick, we hope you get better. I know Elizabeth is uh, <laughs> was planning to join us this week, and we've even got our stories in the in the show lineup, but she she had to sort of bow out at the last minute. So I hope she's feeling better as soon as possible. Um, so next up is going to be Sunday night. We'll do the uh, virtual star party, and uh, hopefully we'll start fairly early, and hopefully maybe we can get that comet. Yeah, there is right? there is there is a comet Brewington there. I noticed. I've been trying to find it. I'm gonna I'm gonna look for it tonight. Okay, that would be great. Um, great. So if you haven't, that's Sunday night. We hook up a bunch of telescopes into a live Google Plus Hangout and show you the night sky, whatever's up. We will show. Pro try and get Venus if we can. Try and get the Moon. I and, should be uh, able to start bringing in Jupiter too. It's starting to come up in the east. Oh, that would be great. Long, so. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks everyone, and we'll see thanks, you all next week. <laughs>